Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we start with a new topic, with Gaussian mixture models, which is basically a sophisticated way of learning about k-means, an algorithm which you might know already of. However, typically k-means is just introduced as a method, and you can try it and it works. We also want to understand where it comes from and why it works, and also like what heuristic assumptions do we make about um, for the k-means algorithm to, de to be derived. And so we will look at, with increasing difficulty, we will look at um, dif different ways of doing probabilistic inference and seeing that k-means pops out as an algorithm at the end. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. Um, finally, maybe not today, but next time, we also look at the, the k-means as a special case of expectation maximization. And expectation maximization can be formulated very general with latent variable modeling, which is very interesting. And it also teaches us some new stuff. So latent variables is like a very general topic. And it's curious how all these things belong together. So in the similar style as the other lectures, we will derive several times the same stuff but with somewhat increasing level of preciseness, right? At the end, always there are some question marks in the head remaining and some things are ugly or approximated, but we get different perspectives on the ugliness or on the, like the, the hand wavy thing. So, and maybe that makes it more clear or more plausible that the thing that we are doing is, is right. Okay, so let's get started. Again, let's see what have we've seen so far. At the beginning, we did a lot of probabilities. And I, I hope by now you appreciate that, that we know the probabilities um, in a very detailed manner. Also today, we will look at a probabilistic formulation of, um, of, of modeling. And there, we will use the intuitions that we hopefully gained from the initial lectures. Um, we started with linear regression and did some support vector machines. Those were like um, supervised methods where we have the input and the output given. And in the last two lectures, we looked at unsupervised method, in particular PCA and ISOMAP. So those were maybe the most important ones to remember or to know by heart or have in your toolbox. Um, today, we continue with um, unsupervised learning. However, instead of looking at dimensionality reduction, we look at clustering. But we will take a, a general point of view. So back to probability. So today there will be lots of P's on the slide. Let's first again rethink, so what is unsupervised learning? So how could we formulate it now with the knowledge that we have? So in unsupervised learning, we are considering n data points, so typically stored in a matrix. And the goal of unsupervised learning is find a good description of the data, right? Where the description yeah, it could be anything. In principle, that's what a scientist is doing, right? A scientist is getting data and then finding a good description, where the description could be an equation or some new law or some whatever, some classification into different groups or something, which tells us something about nature. So it's very, very general. Um, the previous definition was learn a mapping that's more technical, learn a mapping from x to some y, but I'm only given the x, OK? And we have to invent the y, yeah? So that's unsupervised learning. Where the y could be class labels, and it's clustering, OK? The y could be a low dimensional embedding, then it might be PCA, OK? So this is all unsupervised learning. So we could view it more technically, like learning a function from x to somewhere, where we need to invent the somewhere. We could also view it even more general and say, we want to find a good description of our data. Ideally, our description is shorter than the data, right? The data matrix is already a description of the data. However, ideally, kind of we are distilling it, like cooking the data, and then we put something through some distiller, and at the end, we have the essence of it, OK? So that's ideal in unsupervised learning. So we could also view this probabilistically. And then the whole thing is called density estimation, yeah? So that's how I view it. So I think density estimation is just unsupervised learning. So we're given some data points, and we're trying to find a probability density function, for example, for our data. Yeah, this is density estimation. And in a way, that is a quite possibly succinct description of our data. Yeah? So this could be like the parameters of a Gaussian distribution, where we say, OK, we want to model our data as a Gaussian. And 
Density estimation for Gaussian distribution means estimate the parameters. Typically, density estimation um, is assumed to be more flexible, so possibly also we are not given a parametric form of our density, but it could be anything, and we just want to learn a very general function. But since we implement it with the computer, somehow we need to model it with something. So Gaussian distribution is a very simplistic version. Today we look at a more general way of doing density estimation. So here was the dimensionality reduction, just in the same setting. So here the, um, the, the good description of the data is the low dimensional embedding, which was represented as another data set Z, which is lower dimensional. Okay, so that is a good description that we could visualize in 2D, for example, like in the isomap paper. Probabilistically, we could also write it down as, now there's a latent space, so there's something that is like beyond the data, something that we need to invent, yeah? And in the case of dimensionality reduction, we assume there is a latent space, a new coordinate system, yeah? In this case, a continuous probability distribution. And then we say our observations are conditioned on the latent variable. So there's a, for every data point, there's also a latent data point on which we can condition. And if we know this Z, then basically our observation X, for example, is a Gaussian distributed um, vector that is distributed around some output f of z of my latent space. So the f of z could be like a linear mapping, for example, that linearly maps our low dimensional, two dimensional coordinate system into a high dimensional one, okay? And plus some noise. But again, this is eg, so this is just an example, right? You, you could have anything. But the overall concept here is that the lower dimensional description kind of is another, another random variable in a way, in this case coming from a continuous space. And there are zillions of variants of this. And not all of these variants have a probabilistic interpretation. I must be, I'm, I'm a strong believer of probability, so I would say not all of them have an obvious probabilistic interpretation yet. Okay? So if they don't have one, start thinking about it. Maybe there is one. Yeah? And then think about a nice model and you want to estimate it and you approximate it and you're using some clever algorithms and maybe through your approximations you end up with a known algorithm which does not have a probabilistic interpretation. For example, PCA. There's a paper called Probabilistic PCA which is doing exactly that. So they introducing the latent space and they're saying, okay, let's assume we have a Gaussian distribution in the latent space and let's assume our measurements are Gaussian distributed around these f of z or a times z, let's derive everything probabilistically. And as it turns out, it gives some additional insights to PCA method. And it gives also a slightly new method. Here's another one. So let's say our good description of the data are now class labels. Yeah? So instead of having a continuous space, here we have a finite set. Yeah? Or it could be a discrete space. So it could be uh, countably infinite, for example. But let's say it's finite. Also that one we could view um, like very concretely as a clustering, right? So clustering algorithms are doing exactly that. You are given some data points and you are looking for class labels that you need to invent. You have to come up with them in a good way so that they are a good description of the data. We could also view that probabilistically by saying, okay, there's a case-sided dice which is deciding from which class I'm now sampling my next point and then given the class label, there's a mean and the covariance matrix from which I sample from a Gaussian distribution my observation. Okay, it's exactly the same shape of everything. So there's a latent space. In this case, it's a, a finite set. And there we have a discrete distribution, which we also don't know, which we need to invent. And then given the latent information, we can infer our observations. And this is now an example of a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, why is it called a Gaussian mixture model? So we have Gaussians here, and we have finitely many that we are mixing up, okay? So for each class, we would have a different Gaussian. We could also draw it on the board. Um, so having a single Gaussian, it looks like this. So it's giving us some information about the data, right? Let's say the data maybe Looks like that, okay, could be. Yeah, so we have one dimensional data points, so this is um, R, fine. 
And now this is a PDF. So this is P of x. And those are observations. And then it's reasonable to say, OK, we can calculate a mean. Fine. OK, we can calculate a variance. Fine. All from these eight data points or nine data points. And then we say, OK, let's approximate. Or let's write the mean maybe as a circle. So let's say this is now a good description of our data. However, when, when we see this data, it looks like there are two, two types, right? Some of them are here. They're a little bit more spread. And some of them are over here. So why not have two Gaussians? OK, so I could estimate one over here, one mean, and another one over there. And then this thing gets a covariance, a smaller one. And this thing gets a covariance, a slightly larger one. So we have two of them. So like this, for example. Of course, it's not drawn very well now. So actually, this bump must be higher than the other one, right? Because it has a, a, a smaller variance. Um, but yeah, for sketches, it's fine. OK, now we have two Gaussians. And now we could just sum them up and get a summation of them. And that would give us a curve. Ah, OK, let's have another diagram. So this will be a curve that looks like this, going up for the first bump, then it's going down, but not completely. And then for the second bump. So that will be the summation of both. Of course, the area under this one is already 1, and the area under that one is also 1. However, for the summation, we have to ensure that the area under the combination is also being equal to 1. OK, so typically we would sum up this function with a certain factor plus this function with a certain factor. And the factors, they need to sum up to 1. OK, they also have a nice interpretation. And this is already the story of the next slides. So let's go through the next slides, and we see it again. Ah, I forgot to say also of this clustering thing. There are many variants, and it could be like infinitely many classes. OK? And again, not all of them have a nice, obvious, probabilistic interpretation, right? In uh, data science uh, or in statistics, there are many clustering algorithms which don't come with this point of view. But I'm a strong believer this point of view is the right one, and you can find it if you look for it, OK? Uh, let's say DB scan, for example. By me, DB scan has a probabilistic interpretation anyway. So if you Google, I'm not sure whether the original paper made a probabilistic interpretation. If not, there will be a probabilistic DB scan paper, I'm sure. OK, so the more general point of view before we get to that one is we do latent variable modeling. Yeah, we have data points, and we want to find a latent variable where we don't specify whether it's continuous or discrete in this case. OK, we can view it very general. And in a way, this is somehow solving an inverse problem in a way, right? So what is an inverse problem? An inverse problem is something where your observations have been computed by a forward model, OK? So for example, you are sitting all here, and this is like a 3D shape that I'm seeing in front of me, OK? Even a dynamic 3D shape. And now if I take a camera and I take a picture of you, yeah? Then I'm having a 2D image of this 3D shape. And so what's the forward model? The forward model is going from the 3D data to the 2D data. Okay? And the inverse problem is going from the 2D data, just from the picture, reconstructing everything that's here in 3D, so that I can also get the perspective from here or from a different location. Okay? So that is an inverse problem. However, now here we know everything. So we have this 3D shape. And I've made 2D things, so I know where the data came from. In a latent variable modeling thing, we are really inventing it. So again, the astronomer watches in our galaxy lots of star um, spectra, and they're trying to find like the underlying laws of physics behind that. And for that one, they need to invent the right numbers or the right things to kind of structure the measured data. So this is a very general problem, the latent variable modeling problem. Okay. So and here I'm not probabilistically saying, so we must invent some density p of z, and we must invent some measurement density p of x given z. Okay? Now we can also view this as a graphical model, right? which is kind of trivial, but it's nice to view this. And it shows the forward path. Um, in today's lecture, I'm 
often writing a little x, even though I'm talking about a random variable x, okay? So why always these different notations? It's just because of the literature. When you look at now the clustering literature for k-means, that's the notation people use. So I could make it all uniformly, all looking nice, then my stuff would look very strange and different from what other people are doing. I think it's easier for you to adjust to, okay, is the data matrix along the rows or along the column? I think this is one bit that you need to switch, and the other one, What's the notation? That's yet another bit, and there might be more bits, okay? So the question of today is, how can we fit a latent variable model, okay? And I'm not saying, how do we invent it? So we typically assume that we come up with a model, so we write down a latent variable model, and then we are trying to fit it to data. So that's the goal of today. So we looked already at example how to do this, but very concretely, for very concrete methods that did nonlinear di uh, dimensionality reduction, and today we look at the clustering case, in particular k-means, which is also an instance of mixture models. So we will look at the EM algorithm, which stands for expectation and maximization algorithm. And here are some of my sources. So there's a, a nice book, I think, from Mike Jordan, An Introduction to Graphical Models. I'm not sure whether you can buy it or whether it's only available as a draft online, but it's a very nice one, so I learned a lot from this one. And this is not the basketball player, yeah? this is the much more famous statistician and machine learning person, okay, from Berkeley University. So he's really like a superstar. Yeah? I, he's like on the same level as Michael Jordan is in basketball, like in science even, or in statistics. So look at his Google Scholar page. So Mike Jordan, he's really a big, um, a big shot, okay, so he's really super famous. So when you go to a conference, yeah, and there's a talk from Mike Jordan, go there and listen to him. It's always inspiring. So then there's another nice book, Better Recognition and Machine Learning. That's like a common standard textbook which you probably know from Chris Bishop. That is also very nice. And so this lecture like, is like using ideas from both of these and pu pushing them through my brain into the slides, hopefully to your brains as well. So here's some intuitive motivation for our mixture models. Yeah. I did already some abstract example. Here's a more concrete one, which I forgot where I copied it. Maybe I should, should be more precise with my sources. So suppose you're a medical doctor and you try to cure ill people. So one strategy is you have a super complicated procedure yeah, that fits all. Yeah, it's just super complicated and very difficult. And the other one is you invent syndromes, some illnesses, and by these illnesses you can split the people into different groups. And then each group gets a different treatment, okay? Which is the obvious way how to do it. However, in a way, it's non-trivial. Maybe 1,000 years ago, maybe you were a doctor, okay? And then people came to you because they were ill, and that's it. Yeah? So that was the diagnosis, they are ill. And you have no, no chance to distinguish different illnesses. However, then comes science, and you invent different illnesses or different syndromes, and then you can be much more precise with what you're doing. And this is a trivial way of clustering stuff. Okay, so in statistics, you model complicated data, so you could have a very complicated model to fit it, yeah? Or you invent different classes, and then for each class you have a different model. And this is a mixture model. This is what we've seen on the board a couple of seconds ago. So what do we have? We have so-called mixing components, which is, in this case, it was a Gaussian distribution, and it will be a Gaussian distribution today, but in principle it could be anything, any density, yeah? So this is just some density for x with some parameters theta sub i. Uh, then we have mixing proportions. This is like a weight. Yeah? So we want to have the, the weights to be positive, and they should sum up to 1. So they work like probabilities. And then finally, we sum everything up. So mixture here means we are adding them up. Okay? And going back to our example on the board, so basically, if we uh, let's have a couple of more data points up here, yeah, and not more here. Let's say those are exactly 11, and those are 4. Then the mixture proportion, of course, will be, for this one it will be 11 fifteenths, and for that one it will be 4 fifteenths, okay? And then this bump gets lower, and this bump gets higher, which makes sense because here's more data. Okay, so there are the assignments to the different classes. Okay, so far so good. 
Let's represent our mixture model now in a more complicated way. So this is the intuitive, intuitive way to do it, yeah? But let's now trying to use this modeling thing and let's use base rule and let's use it more in a formal way. Let's try to invent it in a formal way. So we introduce a new latent variable z. So I write a little letter z. It should be a large letter, but typically it's the whole thing is nicer if I use a small letter. So it's just ranging over a finite set, okay? We could also say z is one of the first k integers, or we say z is a k-dimensional vector yeah, with binary coordinates. So this is now just a more complicated way of writing things. And the coordinates are typically abbreviated with z to the power of i, which is z sub i. But you know the, sub, the right sub-index is typically counting over the different data points, so we take another corner, okay? So this is just zi, which is like the i-th component of a k-dimensional vector, and it's just set to 1 if our initial variable z was equal to i, okay? It's a little bit overloaded all here, right? Because z is a k-dimensional vector, and then in the next line I'm saying z is an, inti z z is an integer. But I think it's simple enough so that you can deal with it, okay? It's just overloaded, the meaning of z. And you will see from the content which it is. Otherwise, an index z, a coordinate z i is equal to 0, right? If, if let's say, that's some j not being equal to i, I could make it more precise here. But I think that's obvious. In machine learning or in deep learning, this is often called the one-hot encoding of a class, okay? So you have a class uh, from 1 to k, and you can encode it into a vector, yeah? That's it. So we can define a distribution for our z. And we define it like this. We say the probability of being in class i is equal to pi sub i. Okay, now pi is just a nice Greek letter. Yeah, that's it. It's not the 3.115, I don't know. So it's not that one. It's just a Greek letter. And we want that they all sum up to 1, of course. Okay, so now we have a distribution of that. And, um, we can also now define the distribution of x given z, right? So suppose the i's class is the one that is active and all of the other ones are zero. So if I know a data point is coming from the i's class, then my x is just this mixture component. So for example, the Gaussian distribution. Um, now, using the laws of probabilities, we can multiply the conditional distribution with the p of z, yeah? all conditioned on theta, and we get the joint distribution of x and z yeah, conditioned on theta, which is just the product of these two expressions. Okay, so far so good. So we are rebuilding the expressions from the previous slide, the summation of the blah, 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 but we're rebuilding it now by defining new random variables and defining the latent space. So now let's marginalize yeah, on x. So we have a joint distribution, marginalizing with respect to Z means we sum out the variable Z. So P of X given theta is by the sum rule, the summation of all these joint probabilities, okay? And now summing up the, the ZI, we don't do it actually, we now plug in our expression for the joint distribution, and then we have exactly now this mixture distribution that we before kind of intuitively drawn on the board and said, Yes, a mixture, yeah, somehow densities need to be summed up and then renormalized, so that's a clever way to combine densities. Here you see we can also derive it from the laws of probabilities, okay? Which is nicer, I think. Okay, so we have a mixture distribution, and now we, of course, consider a Gaussian mixture model. That's already complicated enough for our stories, but in principle, you can plug in here any distribution you like. Then you don't have a Gaussian mixture model, but maybe a... Uh, whatever, a, a Dirichlet mixture model, yeah, for example. Okay, so far so good. What are the parameters? The parameter of the mixture model are the parameters of the Gaussian distribution, and we have for each, where for each possibility for i, we have a different mean and a different covariance matrix, and we have these mixture proportions pi. Okay, so far so good. So we can do inference with it. Inference meaning we are given a model, calculate some interesting probabilities, yeah, from the model. So let's do that. Let's calculate, now, what is the probability that the zi is equal to 1, given that I've seen the x? Let's flip back 
what did we write down here? So that was just the probability having seen nothing. Okay, so those are like prior prob probabilities without seeing data. And now I'm seeing a data point x. Okay, so now how do we get from this simple expression to this big expression? What rule did we use? Can anyone guess? Yes? Product and sum rule. Product and sum rule. And the nice combined version of product and sum rule, they also have a fancy name. You can just say it, you don't have to raise your hand. You can also say it in a choir if you want to, if it's too simple. So you all know? Base rule, exactly, yeah. So this is always the same. We always use base rule. Um, okay, so let's see whether we really use base rule. So first of all, all expressions have this theta here, in here, right? So let's forget about the theta. Yeah? So that makes it simpler to say, let's forget about the theta. And then base rule basically turns the ordering around, right? So now the z is in front and the x is conditioned on. And then we get an expression where it's the other way around, okay? However, we must multiply with the probability of the zi as well, okay? And then we ne need to normalize, and we need to normalize by dividing through p of x. And p of x is our mixture model, which is just a summation. However, you, need, you see also this is yeah, nicely normalizing the probabilities up here, which are not summing up to 1, right? If you multiply this probability with the other one, yeah, they won't normalize anymore in in J, okay, so we need to normalize them so that everything is proper. But this term down here is also the evidence. Okay, so far so good. Um, I'm not sure why I used a, a capital P. I need to check that one. I think that, is, that should be a small one as well. Or did I use a big one over here? No, it should be a small one. So that's wrong. Okay, let's plug everything in and put it into a nice ordering. So this term in the back here is a pi i. Let's put it in front, because we had it in front before. And the term of x given z, that is just our distribution for a single component. In this case, it's a Gaussian distribution. And then down here, we have the normalization. OK, so I didn't change the order already here, because that's more fitting to our view of base rule. But then this down here, it fits our better our view of having a mixture model. OK, interesting. So now we have tau i, and now we also see why pi i is such a nice letter. So they just look alike, yeah? And they are telling us something very similar. So the pi i is telling us, without seeing the location, what is the class distribution, and the tau i is telling us the probability of being in a certain class after seeing the location, okay? So we have a model now that allows us to classify a data point x, okay? We can just plug it into this formula over here. So, as I said, pi is like a prior, prior probability, tau is a posterior probability, okay? So, simple question, what is the summation of all tau i? Anyone knows? These questions should keep you awake. One, exactly. So, why is it one? Yeah, it's a probability, yeah, you're right. Um, I was, so, we normalized it, so in here, okay, but you're right. Maybe that was too simple. Okay, anyway, so let's, do this reasoning on the board. OK, um, maybe now we should redraw this, because it, it gets a much higher bump here than the other one. So something like this. OK, so that is the mixture model. Now, if I'm having a data point, yeah, but I don't tell you where it is, yeah, then what is the probability of being in this class? Do you know with these numbers that are on the board? Yeah, exactly. Something like 11.15. So that is my pi 1. OK. And now here I'm having a pi 2, which is 4.15. And now writing it down like this, OK, I did already some estimation in my head, right? So in a way, I'm doing already maximum likelihood estimation of the full thing, something that we want to derive. But like this is our intu intuition here, of course, as well. If you've seen 11 example here and we don't have a prior, then this will be the probability of being in that bump or in that bump. But now I'm telling you, OK, your measurement is down here. So this is the x, right? And now given the x down here, the proportions completely change. So the probability of being in the first class will go down a lot, right? Because this Gaussian is very small over here. 
And for the other one, it's reasonably high. So that a better, that's a better explanation. OK, so for the, the pi i might be this one, but now for the x is some tau i. Tau 1, for example, now will be whatever, 0 0.001. And the tau 2 will be 0 0.99, OK? Even though with my x is going further and further, yeah, th this bump is also going down very much. But nonetheless, the tau i's are normalized. So it will be very strongly in the right-hand side class. OK, okay so far, so good. Um, next step. So let's start with parameter estimation. We did already kind of intuitive parameter estimation here. And like the example is so simple, everything is so obvious. The question is just how to write it nicely down with math. Yeah? So that's basically the challenge of the class of today. So we are given some IID data set, so independently sampled. So all the xi are independent of each other, and they are identically distributed according to our mixture model. Okay, And now we want to estimate the parameter theta, which is like a combination of the proportions, the mean, and the covariance matrices. So let's do maximum likelihood estimation. Let's maximize the log likelihood function with respect to theta. So the log likelihood function often gets this letter L. Right, where this is really LaTeX backslash ELL. So that is L. Yeah, very nice. The other one is not very reasonable, so uh, readable. So just the L that I would use otherwise would be just like a stroke, looks like a one. So typically for the log likelihood, we use this letter L. And it's the log probability of seeing the data given the parameter. Yeah, you also see the likelihood is a function of the parameter. That's why the theta is on the left hand side. However, the likelihood is not normalized with respect to the theta. Yeah? But this is an aside. So let's plug everything in. So it's IID data. So our density will be the product of the probabilities of seeing a single data point. OK, great. Logarithm and product, they nicely commute. So the summation, uh, the product becomes a summation. However, then we are kind of stuck, right? Logarithm of a summation. That doesn't make it so nice. That's not so nice. So here now we have our essential difficulty of the whole thing today. So we cannot exchange the inner sum and the logarithm. Yeah? So that's unfortunate because it means if we calculate derivatives here, everyone is coupled with everyone. Okay? And as a preview, the latent variable will allow us to decouple this problem here. And it will allow us to exchange the logarithm and the summation finally. Okay, and then we can derive nice estimation equation. However, we can also do it heuristically, and I will show you also the heuristic one. So this maximization can be done. It's a nonlinear problem, and there's no closed form solution. So that's not so easy to handle. Of course, we can plug it into a solver, and that's okay, but there are better approaches. And now the better approach for this problem here is to introduce latent variables, as we already did, yeah? and then we apply the EM algorithm to the Gaussian mixture model. Yeah? So for motivation now of this EM algorithm, let's first look at a special case of all this, the k-means algorithm. Okay? And have you seen the k-means algorithm already in another lecture? Some of you did? Some? No? Yes? So who, who knows it already? One? Wow, not so many. Okay, so now comes a brand new algorithm for clustering. This is the clustering algorithm that you have to know. Yeah, everyone knows k-means clustering, so here it comes. So forget about mixture models. This is now just a method. So we are given some data points, and we want to cluster it in k clusters. And the clusters are characterized by k-means. That's why the method is called k-means. Okay? So that's it. So here's the algorithm. Let's just look at the recipe. You initialize your k-means with some random values, OK? There are two options. One option is you sample them from some distribution. A typically better option when you implement it is to pick randomly k data points and say, those are my initial means. Why is that a clever way? OK, if you sample them, for example, from a standard normal distribution, like they're distributed around the center, about around 0, around the origin, but your data might be completely off somewhere else. And then basically the algorithm is a bit cumbersome and doesn't work so well. It's much nicer if you assign the means to some random data points from a data set. I show you in a second an implementation. 
And there we can play around with how it looks like if you do one or the other. And then we have two steps. By the way, one is called the E step and the other one is called the M step because the k-means algorithm is an instance of the EM algorithm. Okay, so the EM algorithm is a more general point of view of the k-means. So the algorithm works as follows. For each data point, we check what is the closest cluster. And we do this by checking, so how far am I from any of the means? Okay, so I'm calculating the distances to all means. And then I'm taking the index j, which is the minimizer of this expression, and saying that is the equal, that is equal to, if that is equal to i, then I'm saying, okay, I'm in cluster i. And here now the z sub n is the nth data point, and the z to the power of i is like, am I in class i, yes or no? Okay, so it's either 1 or 0. So we really assign every data point to its closest cluster. So that is exactly the same description as the mass following, okay? So after doing that, we recompute the means. So we look who's in cluster 1. Okay, everyone who's in cluster 1, let's take the average of those. Yeah, so we're multiplying it with 1s and zeros here, the whole data set. And by that, we are selecting the points in the first cluster, okay? And those contribute to the first mean. Um, however, how do we need to normalize? By the number of elements in the cluster, which is just a summation of the zi. So you see, that's why the zi notation is so nice. So it's very useful for these kind of expressions here. And that is the algorithm. Now, one can prove, I think that will be an exercise, that the k-means algorithm is minimizing the so-called distortion measure, okay? So it's minimizing the expression j, where the expression j is basically um, saying, okay, I'm having a sum over all data points, and for every data point, they will be assigned to one of the clusters, so, so one of the summons of the inner sum will be non-zero, yeah? and the sum is basically about the distance to the closest mean. So now, how do you prove something like that, that the algorithm is doing this? Any ideas how to do it? Maybe no idea. So I tell you, maybe that's too difficult to come up with yourself. First of all, you need to notice j is always greater or equal to zero. Okay, that's the first step in your, in your mind. Why? Because the zi are zero, one, and here we are having some square distances and we're summing some numbers up. So this is greater or equal to zero. Great, first step. And then we check that every step, the E step, so the first one, maybe I should put a label in here. So the first step can only make this summation smaller. And the second step can only make this summation smaller. Okay, so we see, initially we know j is greater or equal to zero. Then we run the first iteration, and in the first step we can only decrease j. And in the second step, we can only decrease j. So if we iterate, it doesn't matter how often we do this, the j can only decrease. That it's now really minimizing it, okay, that is maybe, I'm not sure whether we are really showing that one as well. Okay, now I need to check one. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's locally minimizing it, but it's not globally minimizing it. Okay, so it might run into a local optima, as we will see when I show you the code. So, so why is it minimizing each step? So let's take that one. So there are now, let's say, the first data point, okay? The first data point has different distances to the different means, to our current means, okay? And here we are summing them all up, but we're only picking the one where we are currently assigned to. So the first step here ensures that I'm having the smallest distance to one of the means, right? So if, the, if my current mean is maybe 10 kilometers apart, and, but there's another one, one kilometer apart, then the first step will reassign me to the other cluster, and by this, minimizing this sum in the, in, in the middle here. It can only go smaller because of that step, okay? The second one is here, we recompute the means. So that's basically, okay, the summation, um, let's say you exchange the sums here over, yeah, the sum over n and the sum over i, let's say you exchange it. Then you are looking for the different cluster separately, so let's say the first cluster, and you look at for all data points that have been assigned to it, and you're summing up all the distances to those. Now, this mean here is exactly minimizing the distance to like a group of points. That's exactly what the mean is doing. So that is basically the story. So here's an example. I first show you the images. So this is an image copied from um, Bischoff's book, 
uh, where, where I'm also following basically in the notation and in basically the story. So, but maybe I reshuffled it after. I think I gave the lecture already a couple of times, and every time you reshuffle it a little bit, and it's departing from it. But the basic stuff came in, uh, came from Bishop's book. Okay, we start at the top left. We're having our data, and notice it's all green. We don't have labels. We start with two means, one blue mean, one red mean. And this is our initialization. So those are the random means. In this case now, for visualization, they didn't choose data points, but they randomly initialized them. OK, the first step, the first E step, is now assigning every data point either to the blue one or to the red one. And we're assigning them to the closest point. So it's like drawing really a straight line between those. So the Mittelsenkrechte, I forgot what it is. this is in English, but like the connecting one, and if you cut it like at a right angle. And after that, you see that the blue proportion like is there's a little bit more down on the left hand side, right? And the red ones, there's a little bit more on the right hand side up here, just by chance, just depending on where I'm initialized here. Of course, it's very, very unlikely that I'm initializing my means in such a way that like the top and the bottom clusters are just chopped into half exactly. So there will be always some little asymmetry, yeah. And this asymmetry now is the following effect. The next step is to recompute the means. So now the mean is recomputed, and now it's close up here in this, in this area. And the blue one, OK, it has candidates in both clusters, fine. So it will be in between, but somewhat asymmetrically between the clusters. Then again, we draw the separating line here, and we do a reassignment. So that's, again, the E step. And now you see that it's already nicely sorted out who's in which cluster. And if you iterate this after a while, then at some point the assignment will be stable and the means won't change anymore. And then you finish your algorithm. OK? So far, so good. Um, let's look at some code. So I implemented it. And OK, so here's again, now it's really getting confusing. I think this one is a D by. OK, my implementation assumes that I'm having a row of uh, a, a matrix of row vectors, and that would mean n times d. OK? So that's the assumption for the code. Yeah? Actually, the more I think about it, it's a good idea to put it in front of your code and then to say what you are assuming. So it helps you find bugs. OK, first of all, as usual, I have some libraries, blah, blah, blah. And now the first code is just about how do I sample from a Gaussian mixture model, OK? Just showing you how to do this. And for that one, I need a couple of functions. And I usually like to reinvent the functions myself. So I redid some rand int function, which is also in the NumPy library. But it's nice to think about how to do it. So how do you do it? You take a random sample between 0 and 1. So this is a real number. Um, you have some probabilities given, so those are the probabilities of the, the dice, so they should sum up to 1. And then you need to iterate, basically, and you need to check whether your sample point is in which interval. So you chop the interval from 0 to 1 into the different parts, where the different parts are PS0, PS1, PS2, and then you need to check where you fall in. Okay? And I like to do this. And it's fun to think about whether there's a more efficient way. Right? Because this is a for loop, right? Ooh, do we really, really need a for loop? So if you're curious about this, check the implementation in NumPy, whether they have a better trick to do this. Yeah? So that's, that's just a little puzzle on the side. OK, great. Um, then I need, for example, I want to sample from a fair coin. So I say a fair coin is a list of the two numbers, 1 half and 1 half. So what this is this? This is um, an example of input ps. Okay, so that's what it is. Yeah. So this is something I could feed into my rand int. I could also have an unfair coin. Great. I could also have a dice. Okay. And this is just some some Python stuff that you can have an array of length one, and you multiply it with six, you get an array of length six with the same elements. Okay. So we can play around with it, and we can sample from it. And by just looking at it, it looks great. So my rand in function works. And there's also a rand in function area where I can give it a size, and then it will just generate an array of samples, yeah, just like rand n. OK, maybe that's already too much detail. So using that one, I can implement a random dice, right? So where I'm just 
telling you the number of sites, for example. Okay? And it's a random dice because I'm randomly generating the proportions. Okay? So I'm not giving you the proportions as PS, but I'm randomly generating them. And this is again a little puzzle how to do it. So you, you generate these QS and you sort them, and then you need to do some weird computations to get them like properly normalized. And then you can play around with it and think about, so is this a uniform distribution over all dice, or what does uniform distribution anyway mean for all dice? I, that's not so clear. So the way I'm doing it, it is not a beta distribution, okay? So this computation here does not result in a uniform distribution. Anyway, so I can randomly calculate means, covariance matrices, that's more fun, right? You generate, you generate a, a D by D matrix and then you just symmetrize it. And also here you could think about, so what is a good prior distribution for covariance matrix? What's a way to sample covariance matrix? That's quite non-trivial, okay? There is a, um, I forgot the name, but there is also a distribution particularly designed to sample from a covariance matrix, okay? And the output will be always symmetric matrices that are positive definite. Okay, random means, covariance matrices, blah, blah, blah. So these are all my toys. Next thing, sample from a Gaussian, so given a mu and a sigma, sample from a Gaussian, great. Sample once from a Gaussian mixture model, okay, I'm getting all these inputs, and then I'm sampling from a Gaussian with the mu's and the sigmas given as parameters. I can also sample a Gaussian mixture model, so sampling several times. So, and now if I want to see whether it works, I visualize it, okay? Do a scatter plot of sample. So here's a scatter plot of a sample, and it looks like a mixture of Gaussian in 2D, right? Reasonable. So I'm first sampling a dice, I'm sampling means, I'm sampling covariance matrices, and then I'm sampling my data, okay? So that's how you do it, okay? And maybe there's a library function for it, but for the Gaussian mixture model, I don't think so. Why am I doing this? Why so painful? Why not just use some other data? The reason is, when you develop algorithms, it's good to create data which is really following your model. Right? Of course, I could apply my Gaussian mixture model software now to whatever spectra from some stars or some measurements in biology, but I don't know what the true distribution of those ones is. So if it doesn't work, I don't know, is it because of model mismatch? or is it because my method is wrong or something? So I really generate toy data that is coming from my model, and then my estimation procedure should work, right? If that's not the case, then there's something bad going on. So that's why it's a good idea to generate toy data. Okay, um, here's another one. Okay, fine, yeah, those are more circular. So how did I do this? In this case, I'm not randomly sampling the covariance matrices. I wanted to have like circular symmetric ones, yeah? Great, also looks good. So now comes the k-mean algorithm. As you know, there's this secret file somewhere on some secret hard drives called mlsolutions.py, where all the solutions are in there. And um, there's this distance function in there, and there's also my k-means functions in there, okay? However, for your inspiration, I put in here the, um, the signature, the inputs, how I would do it, and so you could follow it. Now that I'm telling you this, I see that I just changed it, okay? Now it's different, so, okay, this is not current anymore. Not current anymore. So th I'm, I'm splitting basically the, I had an estimation step for the k-means, which is doing the e-step and the m-step, okay? However, now I split it up in two parts, which is nicer, yeah. Okay, great, so far so good. Um, then I need a nice function that creates plots like Bischoff has in his book. Okay, fine. And now let's get to the demo. Okay, so here's my first demo. So I'm generating some random um, mixture models, so I'm random dice and random um, means. However, I'm taking circular covariance matrices. Why? Because k-means is not really estimating covariance matrix, it's, it's only looking for the means. Okay? Then I sample my data, and that is the input to the k-means algorithm. And ideally, when I run it, I'm having the true means, and I can compare them with the estimated ones, okay? And if they are right, then everything is okay. And actually, last year, I wrote this code, and I showed it in the lecture, and there was a super big bug. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it did not work. And what was it about? It was about 
that when you have a, a NumPy variable and you pass it on, like the means, in the, step in the one step um, procedure, then I overwrote the value somehow and I didn't clone my NumPy array before inventing a new mean. So my comparison, the old mean minus the new means was always zero because I have overwritten the original one, okay? So that was like a stupid mistake. But now with this great code, I could find out that it works. So I can also run it repeatedly. So now that's another one. So why do I get so many? Okay, now I have five means. Uh, how do we, I have five means. Okay, that is coming from some other code that was executed down below. Okay, great, five means. And um, my algorithm here is only looking for four of them. Okay, interesting. But let's compare them. Okay, the 28, seven, that's this top one here. That's great. The 36 one is found. This one and the, 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 the other ones are not so great. So here are two means very close to each other. Yeah, so that's like not so nice. I think before we understand that, let's look at a picture. Oh, we can plot it. Okay, let's plot it. So here you see what's happening. So we have four clusters. One mean nicely was captured very, very well. The other mean is kind of capturing two of the clusters. And then here are two means which are kind of splitting off one, which is bad, right? But it can happen. Um, let me show you an animation. Then you can see uh, how the dynamics of this is. So let's generate new data now. And now my code is like this. In this, when I execute this box, I'm restarting the algorithm. I'm saying again, iteration equal to zero and I want to estimate four means. And then if I'm into iteration zero, I'm having a new initialization and some nice plot. And if my iteration is now increased, then basically I'm doing one step of the procedure. Okay, so let's do that. Maybe for this one, I'm making this again smaller, like this. And now I'm executing the code one. So this is the initialization, okay? And you nicely see Okay, this is probably the yellow one, right? So these points all get assigned to that one. This mean is the orange ones, yeah? And over there are the blue ones. And this guy didn't get any of the data points. So here's the other challenge when you implement it. It can happen that the one of the means doesn't get assigned any data points, right? So this is asking for a big bug. Now you call the function mean on an empty matrix and this will yell at you because of division by zero, okay? Oh, I think it's only giving you a warning and then some nuns. So you have to be careful with that one. I catch this case. So for that reason, my function k means is giving back a k at the end. So because if there are nuns, I'm removing that one. So it can happen that some of the means run dry, right, basically, right, without having any data points. Okay, so that was the initialization. Let's run the first step. Okay, one mean disappeared, right? Because it didn't have any data points. So the yellow one now is nicely in between the yellow one from the previous assignment, and this one is nicely in the red one. And the blue one is already perfectly clustered here. So now what would you expect next? What will happen? Any ideas? So what about the assignments? Yes. Yes, can happen. Right, so the assignment here will be, so this is the old assignment, right? The new assignment will be just split this cluster into two pieces, right? And yeah, it depends on whether this guy gets more points or fewer points, whether it's getting even closer, okay? So let's see what's happening. And as you say, so since this is cut into half, like the, the yellow mean basically will move further to this side, but these points down here, they will be all turned yellow, okay? So let's do that. Okay, this is what just happened. Now what's happening next? Um, I'm afraid this mean will eat even more of these points, right? And so it will push this one to the right-hand side. And this is what's happening. And now we are done, okay? So this is it. So here you see the change is zero. Where the change is basically the distortion measure. It is? Uh, no, I think it's the difference between the old means and the new means, okay? Okay, so this is visualizing what's happening here. Um, let's do it again. Let's take another initialization and let's see what's happening. Okay, so this is my initialization. Whew, okay, that was a very unlucky one, right? So only these points are assigned to Z cluster. All other points are assigned to the yellow one. So let's iterate it and let's see what's happening. That's it. 
and nothing will change anymore. Question? Yeah, you could reinitialize them. Oh, was it a question or did you read it somewhere? I oh, you're asking, okay. Yeah, you could, sure. However, the convergence proof gets more complicated, of course, right? So somehow it's um, unclear. For example, it could be that you, um, uh, there are only two data clusters, but you started with k equals 17, and then somehow your algorithm won't stop, right? So it possibly won't stop, or it's unclear. So I guess it's better to drop them out. Now, if you want to make a nice library on 4K means, and there are some really nice libraries, how would you do it? You would say, OK, the computation is fast anyway. I'm randomly sampling a 1,000 times means. I let it run, and then I compare the clusters, and I say the result is the most stable one. So I could say, for example, I could define a relationship between two points. How often have I been in the same cluster as someone else? OK? And by this, kind of you get a really nice stable clustering out of K means. But if you have a single um, run, then you get always different results like this. Um, let's, let's be advantageous here. Let's say we now increase k, OK? So we've seen already what's happening. So let's say 10, and let's see what's happening. OK, those are our means. I guess most of them will be empty. Um, how can we change this? Uh, let's increase the variance a little bit of the means, okay? Let's increase them even further, let's say times 15, okay? So again, let's set the iteration to 1, and let's go on. Okay, now they are more spread, so this is more interesting. Okay, so this one is very clear, it will jump over here, right? These are fighting around this cluster over here, yeah? But I guess what will happen is this point will right jump over here, right, into the center of the pink one, this one jumps right into the orange ones, and then they having kind of a fight, which is over immediately because they settle very quickly to where they are. Um, here's some yellow. So this is the one from the yellow one. So it was eating some of those and some of those. I guess after this mean gets updated, the yellow one is empty, OK? And so on and so forth. So let's see what's happening actually. OK, so the yellow one is over there. OK, maybe it survives. Let's see what's happening. It's eating up some of it. OK, the yellow one is eating half of the cluster. But now, there's no change anymore. So let's make it even more extreme. Let's say there's only one cluster, OK? And let's take many. So let's say k is equal to 10. And let's see what's happening. So. Ah, OK, we should use a smaller variance in this case. Um, let's make this smaller, 5. So let's And let's say the, the true mean is equal to 0, OK? 0. That makes it easier. OK, interesting. So actually, it is one cluster, right? But we don't know, right? The data is a 1,000 dimensional. We can't look at it. We don't know whether it's one cluster. But the professor said, please run k-means on the data. I want to see the results by Monday. So you do. And let's see what's happening. So OK, it's kind of chopping off the whole thing into different pieces. Yeah? And now you say, great, here are the results. I invented some new science. So this data now, I'm seeing there are five classes. I'm calling them the whatever, the banana classes. and have a new theory and write a big paper in Nature. Yeah? However, actually, you just chopped up a single cluster. But you can't see it. If you just run the method in a high dimensional space, it's hard to visualize that this happened. Okay? So now here comes something else that you should do. Of course, you should check what is the distance between the clusters. Okay? So you could calculate what is the minimal distance taking a data point from class 1 to class from a data point from class 2. And you could, then you will find out that, OK, the clusters are touching each other. They are really close by. OK? So this is really like chopping. I am not want to say something about vegans or vegetarians here, but if you go to a butchery, right, there are these images of a pig that is like cut into pieces. And this is what's happening here. OK? This is exactly the same image you get. I hope I didn't hurt any feelings of a vegetarian here. But OK. So this is the, the image that I see. So I went as a child to butchery, so that's why I'm having this intuition. 
So the clustering could be really garbage, even though the algorithm gives you an answer. Again, what can you do? You can run it several times. Okay, just I show you it in a second. So I run it again, and um, I will get a totally different clustering result in this case. Okay, it's also chopping off the whole thing, but I get a totally different assignment. And like the groups are not stable. And this is another way to find out. So with stability and then by calculating the cluster differences. Question. Um, okay. So this is like in this case where you have some like high dimensional um, thing where you come up with the cluster, the the one that you want to say for like an all one cluster, but like let's say you have this case of where um like there's one cluster. So for example, I'm thinking of like like height. Like you you measure the entire human population. Right. Right. So you have some high dimensional data, um, and then you find the cluster, but the thing is, it's like it's going to be a big one cluster, like mm. one big, like, one normally distributed, but then maybe like the clusters do have some interpretation. So how do you know that they're like, is it an interpretation? I mean, it is joking, obviously not, but like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, so the, yeah, you could compare the, the different clusters, the distances be between the clusters. Mm -hmm. Height, whatever. Um, the distances aren't like it's going to be like this mm -hmm. because we're normally distributed. So I don't know. I guess so. Yeah, and uh, I think then the clustering in principle ma doesn't make sense. So it doesn't tell us much, it, or it's trivial in a way, right? So there are small people and there are big people. So that would be already a clustering. Ah, okay. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. At least my message is you have to be careful. So that's it. So you have to be careful. Don't trust the method just blindly. Um, and, and repeat it and run it several times and see whether you get the same result all the time. Or you could also now, okay, we are now having all these model selection ideas. We could split the data into two parts run a clustering on one of them, run a clustering on the other of them, and then compare the means, right? And if they don't agree, it's probably some randomness that we measured. Right? Right. So I, I don't think this was a great answer from my side, but um, I'm, I'm just saying uh, be careful with the result. Let's say you are, just a second, let's say you are measuring climate data, right? So temperature and precipitation, and precipitation, I think it's the right word, and, um, and you want to define climate zones, right? So there was a researcher, I forgot the name, but who defined these climate zones. I guess some German from the 1900s or something. Um, so probably the person was traveling a lot and making measurements and then saying, so this is tropical, this is subtropical, this is this, this, this. But I'm not sure how, how clearly distinct these things are really or whether there's a continuum. Of course, there, is, there are some discrete lines between climate zones because of plants, maybe certain plants, they stop here, and then there's another plant coming from the other climate zone, and they kind of make a boundary. Depending on your data, it makes sense to draw the cluster lines, but maybe not always. Yeah. Question. So, uh, would you want PCA in that case? Um, ah, okay, good question. Now, we're doing, we are looking for a nice description of our data, so why not combine PCA and clustering? Absolutely, right? So the first step would be cluster the data into different parts, and then you can apply PCA or isomap on each of the parts. So for example, the MNIST digits data set, it's a bit P of X, right? But somehow we know already, okay, there are 10 classes, but we could also cluster them maybe in many more by saying, so there are certain types of tools with curly or without curly. So we could first split them up into different pieces with clustering, and then we run isomap on them. So that's very reasonable. The other thing, as a lesson is, look at your data. So that's always important, that you look at your data somehow. That's why these isomet methods or these kinds are so important. And there are many more of these projection data. So look at your data, visualize the clusterings, look whether they make sense or not, OK? For example, also people are trying and trying to get MNIST better and better and better, and they don't get below 0. Point something. Look at the wrong examples. Try to understand what's wrong. And then you will find out some of them are wrongly labeled. That's why you don't get 0% error, okay? Because there can be wrong labels in there as well, okay? Um, 
here's something else that you can see. Does this remind you of something else from some other area? I'm already telling you, does it from computer graphics? Yes? Yes, exactly. And it is exactly a Voronoi diagram what we've seen here. I draw it on the board for you, okay? Because then it's maybe more clear. This is exactly a Voronoi tessellation. So k-means and Voronoi tessellations are the same thing in a way, kind of, okay? So um, does everyone know what a Voronoi tessellation is? No? Okay. So I'm, I can't explain it very well either, but I can give you the algorithm how to compute it, okay? So it looks like this. So between two points, we draw this line. And I think in German it's called Mittelsenkrechte. What is it in English? Does it have a name? I don't know. Okay. It's a straight line having the same distance from both points. Okay, whatever. So Mittelsenkrechte, let's try to internationalize this one. Okay. So I draw the Mittelsenkrechte between all pairs of points. However, once they cross, yeah, I'm stopping. And then there's a nice theorem from school, yeah? If you have a triangle, any triangle, and you draw the Mittelsenkrechte, they will meet in one point, which is non-trivial, right? It could have been different, right? But it is the case that they all meet in one point, which is great, because then we get these points. So now this is a Voronoi tessellation of the R to the 2. And now what are the properties of this um, area here, those are the points that are closest to that one. Okay, and those are the points that are closest to this one. You could also visualize now, I, I would need a different color here. Let's say you are playing around with these, some, I think there's some math software, what was it called in, in school? I forgot the name. Something where you could make geometric constructions and then you can push around the points, right? So if you program that one, it would be interesting to see now what's happening if I'm moving those points apart, right? Then these two points get closer and closer, and at some point, the whole thing will flip into something that looks like this. Okay. Okay, so this is a Voronoi tessellation. Let's say I'm having here yet another data point. I'm again drawing a line, and it will cut right here. And then because of our theorem from high school, this will be then the Voronoi tessellation. And you can look at animations. And then there's the so-called Delaunay triangulation, which is the dual of this one, and I'm already drawing it here. So if two points have a connecting line between them, you draw an edge. Okay? And this will lead to a triangulation of the whole space. Yeah? So we don't draw an edge from here to here, because they are not the two Voronoi cells are not touching each other. Ha, huh, interesting. This makes a nice proximity graph, right? So you take a Delaunay triangulation. So I think this is called, uh, written like this, Delaunay. I'm not sure about that letter here, so I wrote it funny. OK, so triangulation, triangulation, triangulation. And the other thing is Voronoi cells. Um, so this makes a nice proximity graph for isomap as well, right? However, when you look at algorithms and you try and, of course, when people study isomap and they paid attention in their computer science classes, like some of my colleagues did, then, um, of course, they thought, man, we, we should use the Delaunay triangulation and use it in high dimensional space. However, it's super expensive. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, calculating that one is super expensive in a hundred dimensional space. So typically, in computer graphics, we're talking about 2D, right? And in 2D, it's, there are some fancy algorithms, some plane sweep and blah, blah, blah things that you can use. In high dimensional, you can't do it. However, it's a very nice, very natural way for a proximity graph. OK, so far so good. So k-means has a very nice connection to computer graphics here. OK, so far so good. So this was the, OK, I, I can show you more code. So I was playing around. I also wanted to have a fancy one with buttons. OK, it's always good to get used to that one. So here's my fancy one with buttons. So here I can step with some clicks. And you can nicely see how these 
things change. And I can reset the means and again let it run. And you see how these Voronoi tessellations come about. I think you can also change the number of means. Oh yeah, that, that's the one. You can either reset the means completely randomly or you can reset them from the data. And by this you are sure that you are in the right area. And then you let it run. And if you want to see how to implement such a GUI, have a look at this one. So that is the whole implementation of it. Okay. Okay, by now we are experts in k-means algorithm and you fully understand this figure. Great. Where were we coming from? Oh yeah, we were at Gaussian mixture models and time's already up almost. Um, but the k-means algorithm is now a great motivation for estimating the parameters for the Gaussian mixture model. Okay? Because in a way, a Gaussian mixture model is um, not only calculating the means, but also the covariance matrices, right? So two things. And so it's a simple generalization of the k-means algorithm. So now, being motivated by these nice methods, there was this assignment, right, that we were calculating, and we even were calling it that, yeah? Let's view this as a latent variable now, okay? And then if we knew this latent variable for every data point, yeah, then we can estimate the means just as before in the k-means procedure. Okay, so far so good. However, we don't know the means, we, uh, we don't know the z's, we don't know the right assignments, so we, probabilistically speaking, we consider the conditional expectation of these ones. So conditional expectation just means, so calculate the expected value of z, given that I'm at a certain location, so the, this condition in the expectation basically put these condition variables back into the probabilities here and my current parameters, okay? Which is just all possibilities, one times one probability, zero times the other probability, and so it turns out to be just our tau i. So is it something that we've seen before? Yes, it's exactly the same thing that we've seen before, but now giving it a different name, okay? Before we had a prior distribution for the means, uh, for the proportions, which was pi, and posterior probabilities, which were the tau i. And now we gave it another name. So in terms of speaking of latent variable models, we could also say this is the conditional expectation, which like intuitively is nice. It's like we have a missing data problem here. We don't have the values for the latent variables. Let's replace the missing values by their expectations, okay? And that's what we do by plugging in the tau. Uh, so we, plug, we replace the zi now with the taus, okay? And now something happened. So here's the zi's, they are zero or one. So it's a discrete assignment. Now the tau i's are numbers between zero and one. So this is now a so-called soft assignment, okay? Basically saying, depending on how far you are away, yeah, the probability is larger or smaller. And depending on how far you are away, you are more or less relevant for the i's mean, okay? but everyone is relevant for everyone else. So there's a hard assignment, and the algorithm is called k-means. And then there's a soft assignment, which we could also do, where we have like numbers between 0 and 1. So far, so good. So here comes the EM algorithm for the Gaussian mixture model, yeah? inspired by our k-means method. So we randomly initialize our means, but also all the other parameters, the sigmas and our pi's. And then we do the first step of k-means and the second step of k-means, where now here we are calculating soft assignments, so we are not having some arc, arc min or something, pick the, cluster sent, pick the cluster that is closest by, but we can calculate depending on the Gaussian distribution, yeah, which tells us how far away are we from the mean mu y, um, mu i. However, note, by having the um, covariance matrices in here as well, we could have an effect like this that there could be a very elongated one, yeah? And these lines are the ISO lines, yeah? So this point is at the same distance as that point, according to our Gaussian distribution with some non-identity covariance matrix. So we have more possibilities here. It also means the assignments don't lead to such a nice Voronoi diagram anymore, right? That only works if my means basically have circular covariance structure. So if the covariances sigma are all the identity matrix, then I'm having k-means. 
If I'm saying, no, my sigma is also a parameter now, then I could also have something like this. And then weird things can happen. Okay, so I show you one weird thing that can happen in 1D. So um, let's say you have a Gaussian distribution like this, okay? And now I'm drawing it super duper precise, yeah? So here's another Gaussian distribution. And what was this thing about being super precise? This second line is going below the other one, okay? And that can happen because of the pi, for example, that you put in front of it. So it can happen that if I would classify now the tau, so on this side I'm in class 1. However, here I'm in class 2, but only until the second boundary. Okay, so it's getting more complicated. So these are nice areas, right? And everything up to infinity now belongs to this cluster. However, if you allow the covariances to vary, then something like this can happen, that behind a small cluster, the other class continues. So there is no nice drawing like this anymore. So it's much more complicated, OK? Gaussians are quite funny. Um, you could e e even have, I think, if you put three Gaussian distributions like this. Yeah, this is the mixture model of three Gaussian distributions, OK? And I think they even have a circular symmetric covariance matrix. The question is, how many modes does this density have? OK? And you would say three, right? Three modes. Here we are in R2. However, you can de choose the parameters in such a way that you will also get a little bump in the middle over here. So with three Gaussians in 2D already, you can have four modes. So it's getting really weird in higher dimensions, OK? So if you want to do this, you can play around with it, right? Take sample from a Gaussian, or you can maybe also just calculate. You can just plot the 2D density plot with colors, with some image, show or something. and uh, choose the variance is fixed of the three identical Gaussians, and then let the triangle get smaller and smaller, and you will see a little bump in the middle at some point. So Gaussian distributions get really complicated at some point. Yeah? So, however, in k-means, we did it in a very simple way. We only cared for the means, and we ignored the variances. Now, if you also include the variances, strange things can happen. OK, anyway, we will have assignments. And it's getting complicated, but we can compute this, right? Just have an iteration over all data points. And then we can use these soft assignments. They are summing up over the i to, the, to 1. So we can also using them to estimate now the means over here. OK, and we can use them. Ah, oh, no, they not, they're summing up to i, but they're not summing up over n. So these tau could be, so the summation of the tau could be an arbitrary large number, right? As it was before, the summation could go up to n before. That's the same as before. OK, so we can estimate and update our parameters. OK, so this is the EM procedure for Gaussian mixture models. Here's a little demo, which I didn't implement. So we can do the same with circles. And now initially, maybe the initialization was the identity matrix, and we have a nice straight line. But now it's like colored, like it's going from bluish to reddish. And so there's something in between, where you basically are assigned to both of them. OK? And again, this is a really nice plot from Bishop's book, which I highly recommend. And now the shape of these things is also changing. So it's not circular anymore. However, it's working reasonably, right? OK, so far, so good. So this is one of my favorite phrases. The question now is, does the EM algorithm for the Gaussian mixture model yeah, really maximize the log likelihood, right? I mean, we are like, we, we really fans of these probabilistic methods, so we should be consistent, right? How did we derive the EM procedure? We derived it by looking at the k-means algorithm, OK? But does it also really maximize the log likelihood? To find out, let's calculate the derivative of that one, right? And with respect to the parameters, and let's set it to 0. So if we do this, I have a full derivation of the missing part on the next slide, OK? We get this to be the derivative. You can, of course, use 
matrix differential calculus. I think on the next slide I'm doing it by hand, okay, which is also fun from time to time. If I set this one to zero, I can get rid of my covariance matrix, right? This is just my multiplying sigma on both sides, then times zero, the sigma is gone. And then I'm having the summation, the weighted sum of the data points minus basically the mean times the weighted weight, uh, the summed up weight. And then by pushing one to the other side, I'm getting exactly this transformation, uh, this expression over here. Okay, and here's the derivation of this. Let's see. Yeah, you probably want to want to hear some details of some of the tricks. Okay, so here are some of the details. So I'm calculating the partial derivative with respect to mu i, where I'm writing it up as if the mu i is a scalar. Okay, which is okay. Yeah, for deriving the formulas. Then at the end. I getting a formula and I can also interpret it high dimensional. But first do it for scalars. Otherwise it's very tough to, to see. Okay, first step is exchange the um, the partial here with the summation sign, and then I have the partial in front of the logarithm, and here comes the first trick. So the first trick is that the derivative of the logarithm of a function is one divided the function times the derivative of the function. Okay, this is I think just chain rule, right? So one divided the function is um, I think the, 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 the derivative of the logarithm function, right? And then I'm ending with the partial derivative of g of a. So that was just the chain rule using the logarithm. So far so good. Now the derivative will pick only the term where my pi i is in. So only the sum and where the j is equal to i will survive, which is z1, okay? By the way, what I just did I was able now to exchange the derivative and the logarithm with this trick here, okay? However, I will tell you in a second why this doesn't solve our initial problem. Okay, next thing is I'm um, having the derivative of this stuff. This, are, this is a constant factor. I can drag it out, put it to the one, and then I'm having the derivative of um, some function f. And here I'm using the derivative of g of a is equal to g of a times the derivative of logarithm of g of a. This is just a variation of this one, yeah, where I shuffled around the terms. So if you push the g of a to the other side, then you have this equation, and at this spot here you have to use it backwards. Okay, this is tricky. This is not so, so it takes a while to really derive this in detail. Okay, and then I have the derivative of, um, so the Basically, the f of i is my g of a, so I put it in front, so it appears whoops, up here on top. I can't mark it. I don't know why. So it appears up here, and I have the derivative of the logarithm of something. Um, why is the logarithm nice here? Because the logarithm of a Gaussian distribution gives me a nice expression. So I did this step only to get the logarithm back in front of the Gaussian distribution. Okay, And then I plug in the Gaussian distribution, and I'm getting the expression that I want. Okay, that's it. It's a bit scary, but the important thing is just to know these two tricks. Okay, if you set all derivatives um, with respect to uh, the derivatives of this L with respect to the parameters to zero, you get these update equations. And they are exactly the same as the ones that we used like intuitively. Yeah, which is good, perfect. However, now comes the cheating. So we cheated, right? So at some point here, we, I said, OK, let's replace this big expression with a tau i, right? So we recognize this expression here is tau i, right? And then we moved on and we said, oh, great, now we have nice update equations for mu i. But this is cheating because the tau i depends on mu i, right? So here's a pi i, here's a pi i, a pi j. So I cleverly put it under the carpet that there's something difficult going on here. So what I really derived here is just a set of coupled nonlinear equations. And they are OK, right? So it's OK to write it like that. But we haven't really solved it for mu i, because the mu i is also in the tau i. And as I said, there is no closed form expression for that one. However, so did we make, make progress? Yes, somewhat, right? So we did it by now saying, OK, let's assume this one fixed for a while. And next time, I will show you yet another derivation where it's, why it's reasonable to say they are fixed.
Okay? But let's move on. So these update equations, once you derive such a recursion, recursion, of course, for us, it's immediately an algorithm that you can iterate and we hope for a fixed point so that it converges for a fixed point. But I don't have a guarantee here, so we have to hope for the best that it works. But being motivated by k-means, which nicely converges, I guess maybe someone can also prove for these nonlinear equations, if I iterate them, I'm reducing some distortion measure. And I'm sure you can prove it for the pi i assignment, yes, for this one as well, and I guess for the coherence as well. OK, so far so good. We got these three update equations, yeah, these ones for the Gaussian mixture model. So we had three ways to derive them. OK, so the third way is, is new next time. So the first way is we replace the unknown assignments with the expected value. So that was replacing the hard assignment z from the k-means algorithm with these tau, OK? So that was the first trick to get to this one. The second attempt was to calculate the derivatives of the log likelihood, set it to 0, and then somewhat we put something under the carpet by renaming nice expression with tau i, OK? Next time, we will look at a more rigorous way to derive this. We will consider the so-called expected complete log likelihood. However, it will be just another derivation from a more general point of view, we will end up with the same equations. Okay? So it will be so we have three justifications why this is a good idea. Okay, so far so good. Let's see, where am I going? Blah blah blah. Is it already that one? Ah, uh, let's continue at this point next time. Okay, I think this is a good good place to stop. Any questions? Maybe I stopped the video before. So thanks for your attention, and see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye at the TV screen.